saved me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and had kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I have given to them. And they have received them and know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me because they are yours. All mine are yours and yours are mine. And I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name and you gave, that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them was lost, except the one destined to be lost, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world, so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. And as you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, so that they also may be sanctified in truth. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise you, Lord Christ. How do you like this Gospel? Isn't it something? Talk about convoluted, turning things upside down, flipping them over, folding them over, looking at them in a different way, starting from the beginning, go to the end, start from the end and go to the beginning, and you get the same thing over and over and over. I and me, thou and me, they and us, them and you, you and me, us and them, endlessly. Why? Because you just can't say it enough because it's so darn important. Because this is the whole touchstone of what we're up to as people who profess ourselves to be Christian. And I don't mean just Lutherans, I mean any of us who share the faith of Christianity and who we are in Christ. And so he says, he's going away. And he doesn't want to leave them orphans. And he almost as if and John paints this wonderful picture. Let's try this as stagecraft, okay? You've all seen Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper, haven't you? Everybody's seen Da Vinci's Last Supper. Disciples moving in, looking toward Jesus, Jesus in the middle. Think of this as a live Last Supper. And they're all there. And they're all wondering, you know, what's going to happen? He's told them that something bad is going to happen, and they're concerned, is it I, Lord? Is it I, Lord? But John goes further than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. All of a sudden, he goes into this Jesus prayed position. He's not talking to them anymore. It's as if the whole spotlight starts to fade. All the house lights are dimmed down. And slowly, every light is taken off of each disciple until there is only one light. It is only on Jesus. And these words go, Jesus prayed. They are now bystanders, these disciples. They are entering into something incredibly holy. It is Jesus praying to the God he called his Father. And he says to them, I've made your name known to them, and you are the one who gave them to me. They were yours, and you gave them to me. And they've kept your word. And he says, I pray not that you take them out of the world, because I know they have to stay even though I am going away. But I want you to protect them. I, I want you to remind them of that word that you have given to me and that I so freely gave to them. I protected them in your name while I was here. And now I know that I have to go back to you, but here I am now in the midst of the possibility not only of a death, but one that they're not going to understand. And without you, without the Holy Spirit, they're not going to get it. They're not going to understand. And so, John has to write this in so many ways. He weaves it in and out. This is what God's love is all about. And they're not going to be loved for what they do. They may be hated for quote, quoting 
my name and believing in me, they will call the way. And so he says, sanctify them in your truth, for your word is truth. And as you have sent me into the world, so now I'm going to send them. And this, of course, is what we call the extension of what the church was always going to be. Sure, we're going to read in the book of Acts the apostles and what they did, Peter, John, James, all the true factors of Peter and Paul going and being crucified and all others going off. Uh, sometimes we're not sure. We think Thomas went to India, but that's all part of legend. We can't be sure, but the one thing we can be sure of is they went out and they had to talk about this Jesus of Nazareth. As such, they become the torchbearers. They become the heirs apparent of who Jesus was, and they handle that torch over to the next generation. And then it happened, generation to generation, century after century, over and over again, in and out of the church, the medieval church, the church of the Reformation, each one of them trying to figure out how do we best tell this story of this Jesus when we read this little section of John. What does it mean for him to be alone, praying to the Father, protect the ones whom you have given me? And there is a relationship in all of this, isn't there? And it doesn't matter, you see, where you grew up or what faith you grew up in. What really matters is why we're all here this morning. It matters what we say and do. It matters how we sing. It matters in how we give the bread and the wine to each other. Because we are now that current generation for which Jesus spoke those same words to the disciples. Make no mistake about it. This just isn't a story about what happened then in Jesus praying for his disciples. This is the Jesus who continues to pray for us today. In the Our Father, we are invited to do what? To pray with Jesus to the Father in the Spirit. It's as if he is right next to us, moment right by moment as we sit here. And he says to us over and over, you are my current generation. Just as I spoke to my disciples, to the apostles, I'm speaking to you now. I'm speaking to you what love is all about. I'm speaking to you that my hands that have been brought up into heaven in bodily form now belong to you in the world. Our whole theme to the church for two years, God's work, our hands, what we do, what we say, has so much to say to the world in a world that is so difficult and even martyrdom as we hear about people being marched to death just because they're Christian. Uh, we're not going to be asked to be part of that march, you see, because here we are and we're pretty well protected, aren't we? But we're not protected from each other and we're still human. It's altogether possible that even though we are a loving congregation, we're still human. And in that humanness, friction arises, things can go wrong. But over and over again, he tells us, protect them. I'm not asking to take them out of the world because this is where they've got to live. And they're going to rub, they're going to chafe against each other, but they have to be reminded as they look at each other, and this is so clearly important, the very person that you look at, who seems to be so difficult, is exactly the person that Jesus would die for if it had to happen again today. This is what the source of Christianity is all about. And so, here we are, gathered a congregation. We've come together. We're going to break the bread. We're going to take the wine. We're going to sing our hallelujahs. We're going to gather afterwards because the youth group is out there washing cars. Why? They're gathering money so they can go to Detroit, so they can be with tens of thousands of other young kids to discover who they are once again at that point in their age. And what they're going to be doing out in Detroit is exactly what God was saying to John. These are mine. These are my kids. They belong to me. So I'm going to speak to them by the tens of thousands. I'm going to reawaken them what it really means to be a child of God. Folks, I looked at a picture of Leslie's mother and father who was gone. <clears throat> I looked at a picture of my mother and father who also was gone. And I think to myself, could we have done more? Was there something that we could have done to have loved them more? But it's over. And all we can do is hope by the grace of God that we did what we had to do. And now we take their place where they used to be. That's where we are now. 
Reading this passage reminds us, I think myself, and I hope also of you, this is all we've got. All we've got is each other, the Word of God, and the words that Christ spoke in this prayer when all the disciples went quiet and listened, and he looked up to heaven, and he said, I have made your name known to these whom you have given to me in the world. That was true then, and it's true right now, here in this church, at this very moment. We are the people for whom Jesus is speaking, and he says, I have made them your name known to them. These are the ones you gave me from the world. They were both yours, but you gave them to me. We are Jesus' gift back to the Father, just as the Father gave us to him. And so at the very end, he says, sanctify them in the truth. And as you have sent me into the world, so I now send them into the world. For their sake I sanctify myself, so that they also may be sanctified in this truth. And you all know what it is, don't you? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that all who would believe in him would not die, but have eternal life.